Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Agreed. Um, uh, at this point, I'd like to also actually introduce, since I've introduced Jeff, I'd like to introduce the, the, uh, the rest of the fabulous orchestra up here. They've never played with me before, and they're doing an amazingly good job. We had one rehearsal yesterday. Now, this is deeply embarrassing, but I'm not really sure I've got everybody in the right order, do I? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Let me, let me this is so yeah. awful. I'm the worst person in the world at remembering people's names. Yeah. We're good. Okay. I knew it all along. <laughs> okay. This is Scott Poley on guitar. Yeah. Okay. On the drums, Tam Johnston. So I wasn't on you. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, they're yeah. fabulous. Aaron, Aaron Bixie on the drums. Aaron Bixie on the drums. Please excuse my horrible social advice. It takes me more than a day to learn people's names. But they're just a good man. That's all that matters to me. And thank you very much. Um, now, as some of you may know, it's, uh, it wasn't any of those acts that actually ended up making a big difference in my career. It was an act that I signed to Apple. A singer-songwriter by the name of James Taylor. Yay! The story with James was this: um, I'd been in a, uh, one of the bands that backed Peter and Gordon on a couple of American tours was a band called the King Bees, and I'd made friends with a guitar player in that band whose name was Danny Korchmar. He's a terrific player, very good record producer, became a great friend of mine, and still is one. Uh, and he and I hung out together a lot after these Peter and Gordon tours. And then some years later, Danny had ended up in a band in New York called The Flying Machine with his childhood friend, James Taylor. They'd known each other from Martha's Vineyard Island vacations and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and they, uh, they were in the band together in New York. And the band was suffering every vicissitude New York had to offer. They were on drugs, some of them. They were starving. They had a manager they didn't like. They signed to a record label and made half an album and the label went broke and all this shit was happening to them. And James decided uh, that the band was breaking up and it did. And he decided to go to London. He had a girlfriend who was staying in London he thought he could go and stay with. And so he took off for to London experimentally and Danny gave him my phone number. Danny just said, look, I've got a friend in London, Peter Asher, I've worked with him, he's okay. You should see him. So thus it was that James called me up and out of the blue, came over to my flat, I invited him over, played me a tape he'd made the day before that had three or four songs on it. Um, something in the way she moves, something's wrong, knocking around the zoo and something else. And um, Sunshine, Sunshine, I think. And I loved the tape, I thought it was amazing. I thought these were some of the best songs I'd ever heard. I loved his guitar playing. He'd been classically influenced, but was playing with jazz, chords, you know, clearly that you've been listening to kind of, you know, R&B records, Manhattan's records, and Segovia records, and Woody Guthrie records, and it blended all this into this amazing music. So, I had this funny conversation with him, which pretty much went like this. I said, look, you're really good. Um, it so happens I've just become head of A&R for a new record label. Would you like a record deal? And he went, yes, I'd love one. And, and I know it sounds silly, but it was that simple. And uh, so within days of him uh, arriving, I was bringing him into the, oh, I had to explain to him, by the way, whose record label that was, which I told him. And he kind of went, oh. And uh, so within two days, I had him in the office meeting the Beatles and also meeting this guy called Ron Cass. We had, we had hired, we decided we needed an American businessman to organize the business affairs of the label. So we'd signed um, uh, Ron Cass, who was a very cool record guy. And we also thought it was unbelievably cool that he was married to Joan Collins. Uh, he must be good. Um, so I, I wrote a memo, an official memo, which Apple, who collect everything, still have, where the memo, as you see, is James Taylor, he's an American songwriter and singer who's extremely good, which is kind of all you really need to know. And, and uh, so we signed James, and we signed him based primarily, I mean, if I had one song that I had to play to people to convince them how good he was, the song I first played to John and Paul, John and, I think it was Paul and George initially, I played this song to and said, look, isn't this guy great? We're signing him. And they said, yes, he is, we are. It was this song, Something in the Way She Moves. Here's how James remembers that chain of events. This is a tune that I, I, uh, I wrote in 1967, and it's the song that got me a record deal with uh, Apple Records. I 
I played it for uh, for Peter Peter Asher, who's right up there. Yeah. I played it for Peter Asher, and uh, uh, and he he uh, played it for Paul McCartney and and, uh, and George Harrison, who signed me to to Apple Records. Those first assignments are my big break. It's a huge uh, moment for me. It's if somebody had opened a door and the rest of my life were on the, on the other side of it. Which happens often, actually, but, but usually in a negative way. It's a door and it's hell on the other side. So, so uh, off we went with, with James. And the James Taylor album came out. We, we recorded it at, at Trident Studios down in London. Um, came out looking like that and, and it did okay. It got some respect, some good reviews. But it didn't do very well commercially. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, apart from the record itself, was that Apple was really starting to fall apart. Uh, the Beatles were arguing a lot more, Apple was losing a lot of money, they ventured into all these areas like film and clothes and, and, and other stuff that they didn't, uh, electronics, that they didn't really know much about. And they agreed that it needed a strong man to come in and take over the finances and get things organized. The problem was they could not agree who that should be. Um, and this. And John and Paul's ongoing arguments coalesced around this issue. In particular, whether or not they should bring in this man, Alan Klein, uh, who John was very keen on, Paul was vehemently opposed to. John essentially won the argument, to cut a long story short, and Alan Klein was hired. As soon as he was hired, I resigned, um, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But I, as soon as I knew Alan by reputation, as soon as he came in, I wrote a letter of resignation and left. So I wasn't actually there the day that he arrived for the very first time. But I am assured that the day he first arrived at Apple is not too dissimilar from this treatment of it in my dear friend Eric Idle's genius work, The Ruttles. The most feared promoter in the world, Ron Decline. <laughs> reputation as a hard man. His only weak spot was dishonesty. Anyone was free to inspect his books, but no one could find his accounts. He struck terror into the hearts of his subordinates. People would commit suicide rather than meet him. So apparently, not too far off I got it. And that is, of course, dear John Belushi playing the, the role of Ronald Decline. So anyway, I loved before that happened, so I didn't have to commit suicide. And and um, I, I became James's manager. We decided that we would we would go and seek sort of fame and fortune in America. I bet my career on his. Um, started a management company. I'd never done it before, but I figured I'd learn it as I went along. And I be believed very strongly in James. So we, we both left for the U.S. I dropped him in New York for a little bit of rehab, of which he was in the mood at the time, and and I came out to California, made a new record deal with Warner Brothers Records, uh, put together a band. I wanted to make this album much more compact and, and less orchestral, so I wanted a, a cool rhythm section. I re we already had our mutual friend Danny Kochmar on guitar. I found a brilliant drummer called Russ Kunkel, uh, who, who's become like one of the great studio drummers the last few decades uh, to play on that record. He'd never been in the studio before. And I'd also, by this time, become friends with Carole King through Danny Kortchmar. And I loved, apart from anything else, apart from a genius as a songwriter, I loved her piano playing. So I hired her to play on the record. So I invited them all over to rehearse at my house. And I walk into Peter's house and I see James, and he's sort of sitting in the crook of the piano, just kind of on a stool, bent over, absorbed in his music, and he looks up and he sees Danny. Danny's his old friend, and they embrace. And then they introduce him to me, and that time he was fully present. And we, we sat down to play. Peter just said, well, you know, why don't you guys just play? We began to play, and I'll never forget it because it hasn't changed. So that was uh, that was the rhythm section for for, for Sweet Baby James and and uh, still one of my favorite rhythm sections by the way in the world they still play together quite often. So that's later. Okay. Um, oh, that's, that's that's us rehearsing. Yeah, we were rehearsing in the house. There was no furniture there either. I had a, a piano and a, a bed and a 
and uh, the cat was free, as I recall. Everything else was rented. Oh, what a sweet cat. No longer with us, I'm afraid. But a nice cat. Um, so we recorded at uh, Sunset Sound. James had some great new songs. Uh, we. So where are we? There's. The... Oh, there's, there's, your, there's your... Thank you. That's. Um, yeah, that's James and Carol and Russ now. I mean, Cooch and Carol and Russ still my favorite rhythm section. I use them whenever I can, and they still play as great as ever. Uh, so we went to then we went to Martha's Vineyard to shoot the uh, album cover uh, with a photographer called Henry Diltz, who you probably know. And this is a picture he took of uh, James and I with one of James's decrepit trucks. And a few minutes after that, he shot the cover that you may recognize. I went on to the cover of Sweet Baby James. And Sweet Baby James came out and, and started kind of slowly to begin with. I was booking James anywhere I could. We were playing colleges, we were playing clubs, we, did, we were opening for people, we were doing anything we possibly could. And our ambition at the time was to sell out the folk clubs. But things rapidly moved past that. You know, people started talking about James as a, a new kind of music. Fire and Rain took off as a hit single, eventually became a, a, a top five hit record. Uh, the album started to do incredibly well. People were writing about it as in this brilliant new singer-songwriter. The term singer-songwriter, by the way, hadn't been invented at that point. Everyone with long hair and acoustic guitar was automatically a folk singer. Now suddenly they were calling them singer-songwriters and James was kind of the leader of the pack and it reached a peak when James uh, they put James on the cover of Time magazine uh, as a new kind of rock and roll. And of course this was great for James, it was a bit disconcerting, he wasn't really ready for that kind of fame. But it was great for me, my management company was becoming very sort of hot and I was the big manager in town and it was good for business and we were all making money. And it got crazier because the next act I signed, my favorite girl singer of all time, Linda Ronstadt, Thank you. Um, also ended up on the cover of Time magazine only a little while later. And as you probably know, back in that year, of course, the peak of rock and roll fame was being on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Now, both James and Linda had had their individual Rolling Stone covers, but finally, Rolling Stone called me and they put me on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I'm the only manager who was ever on the cover, which I'm very proud of. But I'll tell you the true story, which is that they found out and said, we're going to do a story on you and you're managing and producing. We might, we'd like you to go to New York to do a photo shoot with Annie Leibovitz. I'm like, great, this is all great. They said, well, we might consider it for a cover story if you bring James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt with you to the photo shoot. And usually I'm the kind of manager who discusses things very cautiously with the artist who presents the pros and the cons. You know, we've been asked to do this, what do you think? But in this case, did I want to be in the cover of Rolling Stone? Fuck yes. So, so I had no hesitation in bullying James and Linda. James doesn't look too thrilled about it, but as you can see, they turned up and, 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 and got me on the cover, which was nice. Um, during that time, of course, during this whole career, as all this stuff goes on, I've been lucky enough to, 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 to win a few Grammys, um, which is always exciting, including this one, which I really never expected that I'd, I'd win a Grammy in the category of Comedy album of the year. <laughs> it's an honor to get this award in Michael Jackson's living room. This is wonderful. I want to thank uh, Peter Asher. Uh, we call him DJ Mensa. Thank you, Peter. God bless you. He's English. He knows more than we do. God bless him. And this was a, a wonderful thing. It's nice to. Oh my God! Listen, you can actually hear careers ending. <laughs> But do you feel the, uh, the nominees are? <laughs> the producer this year is... Peter Asher. Um, it was great to get it from my Dave Stewart, who's a great friend of mine who I've worked with and is totally great. And of course, Lou Reed, who I don't really know well at all, he's a little bit scary. And, um, and, uh, but I love the way he says my name with his Brooklyn accent. I originally closed my, I eventually closed my management company and went to be vice president of Sony Music, 
which was really interesting because I got to be inside the record company and learn that all the things we as managers and artists that believed they were up to was completely true. Uh, by that time, of course, I was on the other side of the desk. The entire uh, music business has changed massively since, uh, since that time and, and continues to do so to this day. I even see some of those changes reflected in my own family in, 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 in a way because in 1984, in the kind of golden age of the music business when CD sales were going crazy and everyone was making a fortune before they invented the, you know, getting music on the internet, um, everything was going very well. At that point, my wife and I had a daughter uh, we had a baby daughter whom we, whom we named Victoria, and she grew up in that era. You know, James Taylor was our godfather, for example, and and uh, she spent a lot of time on the road in her early years with me and when I was on the road with James or Linda or Carol or whatever it was. And uh, so I guess we, we, we shouldn't be surprised, really, because she went to NYU, New York University, um, which is kind of a big deal, University of New York, but that, I don't think we should have been shocked when two years into it, we got a call saying that she decided to quit university and join a band. And of course, of course there was nothing I could say. You know, all the standard parental responses, you know, that's a terrible idea you have to stay in school, were clearly nonsensical because it worked for me. So thus it was that the cute little baby in, in this picture is, is now this young woman. A band called Cobra Starship. We've done it pretty well. They, they play it every year. Um, I still think producing records is kind of my favorite thing of all the different things I do. Um, and it's exciting because a lot of things do come around in circles. You know, I, I got to work with James and Carol all over again uh, some years back, you know, but, but many years after the original time when we did this live at the Troubadour thing, a DVD and a, and a CD and a PBS show and everything. And Buddy Holly still features in my life. I did a Buddy Holly tribute album not long ago. Jackson Brown, Cobra Starship, not surprisingly. Zoe Deschanel, The Fray, Lyle Lovett, Jeff Lynne, all kinds of great people. And, and Ringo, of course, doing uh, Buddy Holly songs with me, which was, which was extremely exciting. I do a lot of stuff uh, now with Hans Zimmer. Um, we did, uh, we do a lot of movie scores together that I produce and he writes. And we, we actually did a couple of concerts in London uh, last October, uh, at the, the, which you might remember, uh, which went very well, handsome and revealed. He's also the only person I know with a Moog synthesizer sofa. You don't see those every day. Um, we've done a number of movies here. I think the first one we did was Pirates of the Caribbean 4. Um, well, most of the movies we do now have numbers after them. And, and uh, it, it was interesting in that case because to, to bring that movie, to make that movie a little more exciting and, and Spanishy, to, to go along with Penelope Cruz, who is nothing if not exciting. And um, we brought in these, this guitar duo called Rodrigo and Gabriela. Does anybody know that? Somebody usually does. Yeah, we got a couple of fans like that. They're brilliant. If you've never seen them and get a chance to see them, they're the most amazing guitar players you'll ever see. Stunningly good. Um, and they actually asked me. While we were doing Pirates, they asked me if I would produce their next record, which we went and did in Cuba, which was extremely exciting. So we got to record an album with them in, in, in Cuba, with a Cuban rhythm section and horn section. I worked with Hands on the Sherlock Holmes album. I worked on Madagascar 3. I don't know if any of you kids and go and see the Madagascar movies. But on that one, actually, I was quite proud of because I got to write a song for one of the love scenes. Uh, they One of the love scenes, they wanted a song, and... Dave Stewart and I were both playing on the score and heard them say this and we went, okay, we'll, you know, we'll go and write it. So Dave and I went off that night and first following the sage advice he carries around on his iPad, which says have a vodka martini or two, which we did, we then wrote this song called Love Always Comes as a Surprise, which if you happen to see Madagascar 3, when, when the lion and the jaguar fall in love on the trapeze, you'll actually hear me singing this song Dave and I wrote. Um, uh, we did Man of Steel together, the Superman movie, 
which was fun. We had a million drummers in the same room. We did uh, hands off and puts together like a little band. And we all worked together coming up with ideas for the score. Um, the Spider-Man movie, uh, this, was, this is Hans's little writing room, by the way. Quite pretty spectacular. That's my Einziger from Incubus. Um, Junkie XL was a brilliant remix guy. And you can barely see Pharrell there in, in the middle, uh, who's a major contributor. Uh, unless Pharrell and I evidently out on a date. But um, uh, Pharrell, Pharrell, by the way, is, is as nice and as brilliant as you think. He's, he's one of those people that you think couldn't be as nice as he appears, but he is, and, and is brilliant. He's amazing. I did a, a project with Elton John recently that was fun because... Oh, yeah, oh, well, I don't... Yes. More recently I've done Stephen Eady, but we'll go backwards. Um, because I did, uh, a couple of years ago, I did an album with Steve Martin and E.D. Brickell. I don't know if any of you heard it. It did pretty well in America and we won a Grammy and stuff. And uh, it was fun and we, we turned it into a PBS special. We turned it into... Um, and that's the new album. We've just finished the new one, which is coming out in October. Uh, which I imagine will be coming out here at the same time. It comes out in America in October. And then we turned it into a, as I say, into a PBS special. And uh, now we turned it into a musical. We did a, the Old Globe in San Diego, and we're opening in the Kennedy Center of Washington, D.C. in December, and then on to Broadway. That's a musical with the songs from these two Steve Martin and Ibra Cal albums. Because, you know, he's an amazing banjo player and writer, and also a great playwright. And Edie Brickell is a fantastic good singer. Those you can imagine, the scary part of Edie Brickell is when I'm doing a rough mix of something I'm working on with them and I send it to Edie to listen to, there's a pretty good chance that Paul Simon's sitting next to her at the kitchen table listening, which makes it really terrifying for me, I must say, because he's, he's a man of strong opinions and one of the best record producers and singers and writers who ever lived. Um, I did, a, this, as I say, this Elton John project where Elton had asked me, they were re-releasing Goodbye Yellow Brick Road for its uh, 30th, 40th, 40th anniversary. And um, so he wanted to recut a lot of the tunes from, from Goodbye Yellow Brick Road with current artists and encouraged me to choose some people and go ahead and do that, which was great. I, I got to work with uh, Ed Sheeran, for example. That's, that's Ed and me, uh, my house in, in Malibu. The funny part is, of course, when Ed and I are together, everyone thinks I'm his father, for obvious reasons. <laughs> I've even been out to lunch with him and his dad, and they think I'm his father. And he, he's Are a real, you? He, he, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, his mother's very charming, but no. <laughs> um, I got to do a track with Miguel. I don't know if you know Miguel, but I think he's a genius. He's the best current R&B guy. For me, he's the like Marvin Gaye of this generation. Um, did a track with Fall Out Boy. We're a great band. Patrick Stumps, one of the great rock and roll singers. We did a rockabilly version of an Elton song with Imelda May, who I love. She's one of my favorite singers who isn't as well known in America as she should be. Oh look, we put, somehow managed to put the big black line right, <laughs> right across for Imelda. Oh. <laughs> oh well. Um, and we even did some country stuff. We did a couple of Elton songs. We did one with the band Perry, who are terrific. She's an amazingly good singer. And one with Hunter Hayes. I don't know if, if, if these people are well known in England or not, but, but they're both really good. So, you know, when I finished all this album for Elton, um, in, in, in the contract there's always a clause, of course, for the album to be delivered by a certain date, which is, of course, never really happens these days, because it's all electronic. But I thought, what the hell? So I flew to Vegas where Elton was doing a show and delivered the record in, in person to Elton um, to, sh to prove that I'd finished. And uh, so what do you think, Elton? <laughs> Peter Asher, who put all these people together and kind of produced most of the tracks and the a &R, the, the nine new songs, did a wonderful job. Why, thank you very much. I know you I can't resist it. I can't resist it. Um, so anyway, um, so I went to, uh, one of the things I did fun lately was, was I, in the last, uh, not the, this one, but the one before Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, they had invited me to go and induct the first manager ever inducted. And the two managers they'd chosen to be the first members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame were, of course, and inevitably and justifiably, Brian Epstein, number one, and, and Andrew Luke Oldham, who managed the Stones back then, number two. So I got to make a speech inducting the two of them 
uh, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which was a great honor. I, I knew Brian fairly well and was a huge admirer of him, and, and a lot of what I've tried to do as a manager has been based on my admiration for Brian. Um, and I think, you know, his, his, his role is often overlooked, and I, 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 I So I was very, I was very honored that they asked me to, to do that. Though actually, I would have shown up to that particular ceremony anyway, because they were also giving uh, a, a, a membership of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, awarding membership to to my favorite girl singer Linda Ronstadt, which Yay! I thought was a, was about time. And they organized this great little group of amazing girl singers to sing tribute to Linda. She isn't well enough to sing these days, as you may know. So, so she wasn't able to be there in, in, in person. But they, this fantastic group I had to get a picture taken with, which is, of course, Stevie Nicks, wow. Cheryl Crow, Barney Ray, and Amy Lou Harris. So that's me and my backup singers. And they couldn't make it tonight, unfortunately. Indeed. Too bad, indeed. Um, uh, and then, of all the recent awards, of course, I did get one that I had to, had to zoom back to, to London for. And I admit, this is me showing off again, but, but I did uh, have to... to uh, Go to Buckingham Palace for this time. Mr. Peter Asher, for services to the British music industry. The funny part is, of course, they put the music in because officially you're not supposed to talk about whatever they talk about. You know, needless to say, it was not a very secret conversation. He kind of went, How is the music industry? And I said, It's terrible. <laughs> but I said, The good thing is, the music is better than ever. There's tons of great music. So the industry is not so great in the music, and he went, oh good, oh good. And that was pretty much the extent of it. But anyway, that was very exciting, and, uh, and you know, quite something. Uh, but when people ask, thank you, Jim. The funny thing is that people ask, you know, all these different things I've done, and my, my things I'm very proud of, like my association with the Beatles, which means a lot to me. Um, you know, will that be, do you think that's what you'll be, like, remembered for? Uh, and I don't know, I said maybe, because you know, certainly the Beatles are incredibly famous and anyone who had anything to do with them, that becomes a big part of their lives. But, there's something else that, that, that I seem to have become famous for now in somewhat in America, um, for which I can take no credit whatsoever. Because it's not something I did at all. It's really something that was kind of done to me. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with TMZ television over here, but, but I will let the geniuses of TMZ explain this particular quirk. Is it true by 